Welcome back. I am very excited to introduce our next guest. Vales Shepard is a first time fiction author, and we are going to hear all about her new book, A Good Ending for Bad Memories. What I love so much about this woman is that she grew up with a love of words and books and and when you sit in your grandmother's chair reading her books and reading your books, it does leave an indelible mark that ultimately, in this case, has resulted in a wonderful, wonderful new read. So, Vales, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All mine, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. I'm pretty sure our, our viewers are going to love this as well. So you're also a founding member of the Washington Independent Review of Books. I mean, you really have spent a lot of time in the world of books. So what, what brought about this most recent, I want to write my own book, and by the way, I'd like it to be fiction? Uh, truthfully, I have written my entire life. So um, this is the first book published. It's certainly not the first book I've written, and I always preferred fiction. Um, I have a, an imagination that uh, is broad and always at, always at work. <laughs> and so I wanted to lasso it and put it down on paper this time. And a good ending for bad memories, I think, is a good representation for the first time. That, the other books are, are unlike it, but um, it was a pleasure to write. So I think it was a good thing to share first. So tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to this. I know I love the grandmother's reading chair story, but I know there's so much more. Well, I am a second generation Washingtonian and I've lived in, um, you know, I've, I've stayed here through high school and then went away to college first to New Orleans because um, my family had, we had relatives there and they took us when we were young and I fell in love and I thought I only want to, I want to live in Louisiana, I want to live in New Orleans and that lasted for about two years. <laughs> then I moved to Paris, then I moved to New York and um, I liked living in different cities, I prefer walking cities. Um, when I finally came back to Washington DC to live, it wasn't, it was unexpected, like I thought I would retire in Washington because I think it's a great city. I didn't expect to live here, you know, having married and children, but that's what brought me back. I joined a writing group and we were together for a while. It was um, about 12 members. And then the Washington Post decided that it was no longer going to publish Book World. And one of the members of the writing group, David Stewart, called on as many of us as he could, like, we've got to do something about this. If they won't publish, you know, a, a, a weekly or anything about books, then we'll do it ourselves. And that's how it began. That's wonderful. And so you've really been involved in the process, but what about when you actually sat down to write this book and you say the story just flowed? Did you, did you have a process that you were using? Um, sure. So the first thing I must say that what stayed with me and what sort of was the germination of this book was an article that I read many, many years ago um, in a daily newspaper, and it was written by a woman who actually suffered from multiple dis multiple personality disorder. And she wrote about her life, pure and simple, just what the day-to-day -day life was like for someone like her. And it was one of the most fascinating things I ever read, and that stayed with me. And I knew that, you know, somehow, you know, I want to be attached to this in a way. And so I, I did the research, and I happened to grow up in a neighborhood where two spinster sisters lived, and the one thing that we knew about them was that their father had been um, one of the first African-American attaches to be assigned abroad. And we just get glimpses of them and, and I use my imagination to imagine the rest of them and to imagine their lives. And so in a sense, it was bringing together things that, that interested me. Um, in terms of the process, I, I don't know why, even though I grew up in Washington, DC, I feel like I must be a farmer's daughter because I'm up at the crack of dawn. And those are probably my most useful hours. I'm definitely a morning person. And one of the things that, I mean, discipline was hard fought for me. Um, I remember when I first started writing, it's a number two pencil and a spiral notebook. <laughs> and, you know, as you get older and more tools become available, I mean, imagine how much better it is to be able to type and how much faster the words come. But the one thing that I think that's important to my process is that I stop on inspiration. So, or, or I stop in the story when I know exactly what's coming next. And that way, when I come to the page the next day, I flow into it right away. And I write until maybe I'm a little more 
um, I need to bring the imagination in because often enough it's you're you're writing from point to point like I know this is going to happen I know this is going to happen and my imagination has to carry the reader and the words from one point to the other that's amazing and I I do believe that the process for fiction may be different than nonfiction, where people are writing perhaps from their expertise as opposed to creating the stories and the characters as you go, which I find so interesting, in addition to a great book title. <laughs> I really, when I first saw your title, I thought, there is not a person on the planet who wouldn't like to be able to have <laughs> ending for our bad memories. So tell us a little bit more about the story and, and how you came to the title. Um, one of the things that, that goes on in the story and that happens to each of the women's successive personalities and they always appear in the same order is she doesn't know what happened to her. She doesn't know what's the cause of her original trauma that, that causes a multiple personality disorder. And you know nowadays, some, some um, people do not believe it it exists and others are, are, are sure that it actually has. When I did a lot of the research, I never, I spoke to some physicians or psychiatrists that spoke to patients, but I never met one. And, you know, it's very real for them. And what they say is that, you know, you invent these other characters to help you deal with the trauma or the things that happened to you in your life. You need a little help um, uh, processing. And so this character is, is searching to try to understand how she is as she is. And in order for her to do that, she sort of rifles through the past. And it's like everyone else, you're a family of four, there's an event in the family and you all remember it differently, just slightly differently. Or each of us have seminal events that make, um, that, that make us up or that's what we are, the result of our memories. And if you have a memory that's unreliable, then how are you what you are? And so that's what I was playing with the entire time. And um, and each of them are different because they see things differently. And each of them has a different um, memory that affects the rest of their lives. And so I was bringing those all together. And the one thing that she would always do is make her children listen. And I don't, and, and she never says that, or the character never reveals whether or not she'd hope the children <laughs> were gonna help her by remembering all the things that, that she tells them, but she would always call them into the room like, oh, quick, you know, here, here's a memory. I wanna tell you something. And um, so that's the way that the story progresses. And I, I can't be a spoiler here and tell you what happens, but. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want you to either. I want, I want our viewers to rush out and buy your book for sure. Absolutely. But I also wonder if in creating these characters and the story, do you have a favorite character? I just, I wonder if you kind of <laughs> in love with one more than another over the time that you're creating them. Uh... Well, you know, I love the mother because there are so many of her. So it was, you know, it was lots of material, lots of fodder. But one of my other favorite characters is Celsi. And Celsi is the great grandmother in the story. Celsi was a slave. Celsi also suffered from multiple personality disorder. And her great granddaughter knew that. And part of it was like, uh, if Celsi healed or, or eventually became whole, could that happen to her as well? And the thing that I like about Celsi is that she's a slave. And how in the world, you know, I've been asked before, how could you create a slave with multiple personality disorder? How in the world did you, was there enough of a, of, you know, a person? Because we usually just think of slaves as slaves and there's not any um, sort of um, entry into their personalities and things like that. And so it was wonderful to imagine her and to see what it would be like to, to be a slave and to also have this other life and to be recognized in town because the town folks, because she grew up in a small town, they recognized that um, something was wrong and they used to call her two for the price of one. So I, it makes so much sense when you talk about people who have gone through trauma that we would have to find a different place in ourselves. And certainly the whole experience of slavery was was a very um, logical place for that to happen. So the fact mm -hmm. that you have two women who are bringing a similar 
outcome, but from very different stories, different perspectives mm -hmm. is really is just beautiful. So what have you heard? What's the feedback been on the book? What have you heard from readers? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've had such a good time. I've had some brilliant reviews, which are just lovely. And they compare me to people that I would never, I was like, oh, you know, like Toni Morrison or a uh, Colson Whitehead and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And I must say, all of whom are writers that I love. So that's very nice. Um, I went to a, um, a book club reading in, of all places, Austin, Texas, and it was lovely. And it was so funny. In the course of the reading, one woman said, I just don't buy it. I just don't buy how this, uh, you know, this one brother, you know, did such and such in a story. And another person before I can answer said, of course, don't you remember, <laughs> you know, she explained it for me. And I thought that was wonderful. I mean, it's so nice that someone has, you know, taken your words, read them and, and understands them, you know, well enough to explain to someone else. So I didn't even have to open my mouth. I've, I've had very good um, reactions and reviews and it's been a pleasure. And that's nice. That's wonderful. I think mostly it's wonderful to know that people have connected so deeply with the characters that they have come to embody and understand their personalities that they can actually reiterate for you. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So what's next for you? Well, I am polishing a book and right now the title is called uh, A Dr. Frankenstein in Eden. And I will say that I think that I'm, I'm forever going to write about families because I think there's so much room and information there, room for the imagination. And in this case, it's a family that have, they've come together um, as friends and decide to raise their children together. One of their, there are two women that used to live in New York and things begin to happen so strangely in the city that when they get pregnant together, they decide they better go, so they, they, they better go someplace safer and nicer than this city. So they move to a tiny town in North Carolina thinking they can become homesteaders, grow their own food, live off the land, but it's not exactly what they expected it to be. <laughs> so that's where your, your farmer self comes out. And <laughs> I, I hope so. Well, no, they're, you know, no, because they're terrible farmers. I, I hope I can grow something, <laughs> but they, they, they don't have us, they don't make a success of it, but uh, the town has, is rumored to be like an Eden and that's why they selected it, but Eden is an Eden. <laughs> Well, not every day of the week, I guess. So it'll be interesting to see how you create your version of Eden. And I'll look forward to that. For now, where can our viewers find a good ending for Bad Memories? How can they get it? They can get it on Amazon and uh, they can get it from my website, which is bellshepherdbooks.com, spelled the way it is. Um, um, Shepherd has two Ps, E-R-D. BaleShepherdBooks.com, and I think any bookstore like Barnes and Noble will, you know, I think you can almost get it anyway. Um, but if you have a local bookstore, try to order it from the local bookstore. I'd love to support the small stores because um, we all know we can get everything from Amazon. But my preference would be it would be lovely if you bought it from your local small store. Perfect. Well, we'll put the information on the screen, and we'll also follow it up with the blog on the website. So thank you thank so you. much for joining us today. I really hope people will find a good ending for Bad Memories, learn more about it, and learn more about you, because obviously there's more to come. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And we'll be right back. <laughs>